So we have to not be one minute, so we need to be at the end. In a grid, a, a small business it wants to do business with this Indian beer bar, there will be no barrier that will prevent them in terms of discrimination. No small business or individual will have to endure discrimination in the process of planning the business of the city. And so, the city of Beer Bar leadership, they've actually allowed us in the city to expand our inclusion efforts to have an act on some of the procedures in place that have been planned now. Then, what is that? We have monthly working hours, but we learn that a lot of businesses, and it's really sad. We're sitting in New York, I met with over a thousand businesses now, and I'm four years and it's a young lady. I keep applying, 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 and I keep getting, um, losing the solicitation. So I said to her, Okay, so we need to figure out what's, what are you doing wrong? And what's what's the problem? Well, they just don't want me. They don't want me to try business. And I said, well, listen, did you know that if you lose a bid, that you can go to procurement and the procurement department will sit down with you and tell you why your your solicitation was not accepted? She was like, I didn't know that. So she had gone on really wonderful. Had a beautiful presentation because in that solicitation, you're telling the city or any agency, here's my story, here's what the goods and services that I can do. She had a beautiful presentation that um, made. She went, and every time the city had the solicitation, that in my church, she submitted the same proposal. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? If it's an ITV invitation to bid, lots of students might not go there, it's price based. She didn't know that. She just said, thinking, I know I, I went and I did what they said, make a good story, tell my story really well, but you have to be comparable and pricing if it's an invitation a bit. So that's what we learned, and I was able to learn a lot of things were going on that were not discriminatory. It just means we needed to educate them a little more about the process. What, what is the RFQ, request for qualifications? If they did, and sometimes they'll just submit out and we have three quotes. So we've implemented quite a bit of things to ensure more inclusion. And that big, big initiative are those kinds of things that we're doing. So make sure you as a business are fit in your agency and your organization is more in a position to be more competitive so that you can secure opportunities. Technological advances, we have a B2G now software. That's the software now whereby we are going to assist on contract between some consultants to be able to do digitally monitor and comply and that um follow through with those um requirements, performance requirements that are on the contract once you are successful. So we don't just leave you at the solicitation table. Once you are able, we believe you will be able to secure a contract. We want you to know that we have some things in place to help you be successful on the other side. Of having secured that. Big Connect is an example of the day virtual mentoring. We have, and then we have one of my contractors in place on, uh, on a project, and, and they, they will tell you I still apply a project. Um, I go to the construction site, I have my hat, I have a sort of thing. I wear my shoes out, it's seven o'clock in the morning, I'm at a breakfast, and then I go and I switch, I have a shoes, and I switch to and I put on my lip gear and have the construction site on these. And so we try to get more inclusion. Um, to the contract well, I can do this for the work you know, probably can try to scoop out as much work as I can for you. And then the other person said, I can't do it. So that's why I said, can you train me? He says, yes, right? That is accurate. Structuring, moment I'm concerned. Yes. So the virtual mentoring is more than just, we went virtual because we went in the pandemic. But the mentoring that we're looking at, we're really looking at you with the construction and my contractors that I see my other construction that's music to your ears, right? So when you are on this process, even if no problems asking, all I can say is no. I might, they will have to say no to me. I have no problems asking anything on your behalf. Because it's just, you know, and we at the city and we're fine. I'm so proud to say my contractors will be an exception. They not only work really, really well with the, the sub consultants, they go up on the interview for these programs, even though the city and the discovery study concluded they needed to do a measure better job before we had these programs in places. They were, our leadership were adding percentages and um, 
requirements under contracts that our contractors were willing to do, and not only did they follow through, but they exceeded those goals. And so I want to hear that the city of Myanmar is definitely a place where you should consider you know that it was a lot of and opportunity to be able to ensure the inclusion and to continue to keep the programs and services that are going to ensure your success once you are successful in securing an opportunity. These are other things like reporting and all of this is talking about. I thought you were know, my favorite to be beautiful and energy time. And all of a sudden you're looking at what I'll be a program, my heart to give I provided you with resources and how to do this is the city, the procurement of property and who she is there. I also have a thousand parts for the procurement director as well as the assistant director, all of the tools you might need. And I look at all of your presentation of the staff can you know the issues that they're not being and it will be because the deal is happening when you first have step across the scheme and send it back into so. So why are we here? One of the things that we always try to do is learn a lot of a lot of the construction projects and other projects are too large for small businesses to do for themselves. So since the 90s, these types of programs and services have been recommending that small businesses um partner again. Two months so that you can get a lot of used to be doing it and it was good. But guess what? It can include like we failed to see, remember, building programs for that consultant that gave years or they didn't have partnership agreements in place. They, although they say, I'm the founder, so you don't want to come, you leave let you go, I don't need to do it. Well, there are a lot of deliverables in the contract <laughs> that go beyond the skill set. So we learned a lot of those partnerships that did not fit itself in terms of all lots of money, whether or not they have price money so that everyone on the team can be financially profitable. Because the people in business can make money. And so that seeing those types of hardships, seeing individuals go out on some vacation to read it and lower the cost so low to be able to read the video, and they want to end up in the And remember, at the end of every solicitation, I said Tommy Tracks. <laughs> and the city was good enough to know that the ladies and really good. And they have an open and door process, and it can be really, really nice to you a contract this kind of thing. And when you say that the contract, when you say that you have to be able to perform those services, but that price, unfortunately, being open, fair, and impartial, we have an obligation to hold you a fiduciary duty to hold you to what you say. Why? Because there were other bidders on that contract that did not, were not successful. They did not secure that. So the city can't come up and say, oh, you're so nice. I'm going to go up with your price for you because we didn't realize you didn't understand what you were doing. So, those formations are why today's section is so important. You can learn some information about contract, well, not contract, um, partnerships and the agreements and all of the services that the Burger Center will be able to do you if you are in the financial category because you're going to more detail about it. And if you sit with you, that will not happen in this session. Why? Well, because legal services are personal and private. So definitely won't happen here. But you will learn how you can pierce this. It's all the way over there. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And let's and apply for the proposal. So we have everything else. Again, we have just um, salads without, we have chicken salad on top of salads, we have tuna salad on top of salads, um, seasoned salads, we have turkey sandwich, ham sandwich, salad wraps, and all of that are Caesar wraps. So feel free to take off and drink the water and you can enjoy the beer. And the bathrooms are just um, outside of the barn where the barn is to the right. Okay, so I think that's everything for housekeeping. I will be available to come up for any questions that you have after. But for now, I will give you Mr. Stephen Cox of the Burger um, Law Center at Nova Southeastern University. Please help me on what. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity for myself and my students to speak with you today. Um, you're actually six students who uh, started in the Club of Burger, I'm a law clinic at the NSU School of Law. 
and uh, I'll tell you about our clinic in a minute or two. But I have six students in the clinic this semester, two of whom are here. Two of them had class till 11 a.m. this morning, and they're driving here from the school. Yes, one of whom you said, one of whom I don't know where she is. So we may have to change the order a little bit if you go along, but we're going to cover it all. Um, let me tell you about the, um, oh, please, please come in. This is one of my own students. It's me. Uh, so let me tell you about the Burger Country Door Walk. I think I mean, we have spoken to the city of Jeremiah two times before, and uh, we have taken on uh, some clients for the walk clinic <coughs> from uh, meetings at the city of Jeremiah. And uh, what, what is this clinic about? Uh, Sharon and Mitchell Berger. Uh, Mitchell Berg, who is a law firm in uh, Fort Lauderdale in Miami, it's called Berger Singerman. It's a large, good sized law firm, South Florida based. And, uh, and the Bergers are very involved with the, uh, with the NSU, which is on the Board of Trustees, and Sharon's on the you know, Board of Governors. And they are big believers, they're entrepreneurs, they're big believers in South Florida. And they said that they believe the next growth area in South Florida is startup businesses and entrepreneurs and small businesses. And they want to support that. And how do they feel that you support it? Well, for the law school, they believe that in order for small businesses to thrive, they need lawyers and other types of service providers that are capable of meeting specific needs of small businesses. So they created this clinic. I'm the director of the clinic. And in my clinic are mostly third year law students. They don't like their third year. Tomorrow will be arriving shortly uh, to say class this morning. And, uh, and they're going to be graduating in a month. I mean, the semester is almost over. And uh, Taking the bar in the summer and knock on wood, you're going to be members of the Florida Bar come uh, late summer or early fall. Uh, and they're going to be practicing, but they will, they, for the last semester, have been working in the clinic with small businesses or, or not for profit corporations or other entrepreneurs uh, in giving them legal guidance on how to set up their business, contracts. Uh, Dr. Hollis mentioned, we don't have that in the program. She really wanted to talk about the uh, uh, just forming the companies and getting them set up, right? It's crucially important, and I'll explain why in a second. But if needs be, we're going to be here till one o'clock, and I, I'm happy to talk to both. I've never found a microphone I didn't like. So <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions. We're going to have QA at the end anyway, but if you have questions about contracts, we, we, we do a lot of that. So what work do we do? Our primary uh, client's base, first of all, qualifications to be we're a pro bono clinic. By that, we don't charge for our services. But quite frankly, it's very easy to get clients when you don't charge. <laughs> I've never had a certain time in my life <laughs> But we only have a certain amount of clients. And a clinic there's no specific guidelines. Some go to Broward Legal Aid uh, or things like that. A certain percentage or multiple of the poverty line. We don't have that, but it's, it's more a, a question of you know, if you've got a lot of money in the bank or your business has been going a while and it's got a good amount of revenue, you can afford a lawyer. And although we can help you, We've got other people that can't afford a lawyer, so that's that's what we do. So we do get the financial capacity as part of our intake criteria. The second thing on the intake criteria we look at is is this something? Our mission is actually to help the public like yourselves, but also to train future lawyers in performing. So is the nature of the work that that uh, you would need done something that students could do under my supervision? Long time practicing lawyer. 
and uh, we can take on most anything, but there's certain things we don't do. We don't do tax planning. We don't do patent filings or trademark filings, but we do all sorts of corporate business. We don't do securities filings, trying to go public. That's that's a step ahead. People are already, they should have. I, I've done uh, IPOs and other things in my, I worked for a large firm in Miami, I did, and I retired from that. I can do that, but it's beyond the scope of what I can be doing. It takes a lot of time to get these things done, sophisticated uh, experience and knowledge. So, what do we do? We sit down and we're going to go over a couple of these things this morning. And uh, we sit down with people that are have started a business. Stephen, come in and see up here. Um, and what typically happens is we're to us and either have a business or they're going to form one. Uh, and one of the first questions is how should they be structured this business? And uh, should they be corporations? Should they do something else? And we're going to talk about that. My students will be talking about that. Second thing is now how do we set up the documents for that business? After that, we talk about the things you need to do to keep your business in order. You're going to hear all about that this morning, and it's crucial. And I know Stephen's going to tell a story about somebody, one of our clients, that it's very typical that small business doesn't do it right. They, they start the business and file an article of incorporation with the state of Florida, and they don't do anything else. And later on, I can come back to point you. Uh, and so we try to get them set up properly. But then the next thing that the clinic does quite often for our clients are contracts. You may have customer contracts. You're dealing with customers, you may contract between the company or yourself if you're operating a sole proprietorship and your customer, you have a customer contract. You may have bringing on people such as independent contractors who work for your company. We have independent contractors who work there. We customize those to your needs. Uh, there's other, you have a website, website terms of service. You see, you know, there's any time you log in, you know, I agree. Uh, privacy policies. Uh, and then on the nature of your business, you may be regulated by somebody in the state of Florida uh, or even something like the city of Miramar can be an occupational license. Very simple and uh, not that expensive, but if if you don't have it, you're not in compliance and you can give me a fine for it. Or let's say you're doing a type of, let's say you're doing a restaurant. Maybe you need something by the Board of Health to get a certification before you can open that. So we're, we're, we're uh, counseling on that. So a lot of basic nuts and bolts. And the one thing that a, a good lawyer will bring to the table is you can get a lot of the documents you need pulled right off the internet, but they may not meet your needs and a lawyer will sit down with you and say what are you trying to do try to understand your business understand what your needs are apply the knowledge that the lawyer has saying oh by the way you should be thinking about this or that provide options to you you make the decisions business decisions the lawyers will document it and get it set up the way it needs to be so that's that's a little bit about the clinic uh we have uh and I'll be happy to pass these out. This is our intake. And what I'm going to ask you to do here. And, and I'm going to give you good news and bad news. We are here to provide free legal services. We are at the end of our semester, uh, about a week and a half from now. And we can't, we just took on two new clients this past week. And we got about a week and a half in the semester. We can't take any more clients for this semester because they graduate. Actually, the 19th is the last day of classes. They didn't go to finals and they graduate. So we can't be taking on any more clients this semester, but we will be back in August and we'll be going from August till uh, April. So if you have needs, you know, we, we can be available. It's a simple form, two sides. Just Give us a little demographic information and the nature of what you need. We'll sit and have an interview with you. There's no charge for our services. We can do it by Zoom or in person. 
and it's in law school is about seven or eight miles from here. And uh, here's one of, another one of my students. Uh, he's not late. He had a class till 11. He got here right as soon as he was. And, and, and look, we're happy to talk to you. So uh, with that, I'm going to just give you a little bit uh, of uh, a roadmap and introduce you to my students. And before he gets that, in terms of our time, the last time we did this, the students were ready to provide their services, but we have to do the application process. You have to go back and figure out what it is. But so now we want you to come in, meet the students on the way out. You have time, get the application in place, figure out what it is that you need to help it serve you so that when the team come back, then he's ready. He already has things in place for his next task. Okay. So today we're going to be speaking for about an hour of which can be 45 minutes or so to cover these topics, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. So the first thing we're going to have is the first uh, speaker will be Elise Cardenas, uh, and she's going to talk about doing business as a sole proprietorship or as a general partnership. We're then going to talk about doing business. Uh, Nick Tremblay will speak on doing it through a corporation or a limited liability company. Uh, aren't you? Can I raise this on East? <laughs> Nick? Okay. Uh, then Claudio Villa, who's going to speak about what you need to do to set up your business in Florida. That's Claudio. Uh, Anna Eskenazi uh, called in sick today. She was going to talk about nonprofits and social purpose corporations. I will fill in for her and cover that. Then we're going to have a, a topic on corporate governance with Stephen Daly. Right there, Stephen's going to talk about that. It's your bylaws and things of that nature. And finally, post formation ongoing compliance requirements, Alex as Kev's. Alex will speak. And then at the end, we'll take time for questions. And uh, and uh, that's how it will she is. So, Elise, I want to turn it over to you. And I want to show you that for those that weren't here right at the beginning, we do have a screen right here so you can see. You have the a keyboard and you just hit the down or whatever and it slides a screen to it. As my said, my name is Elise and I'm going to be talking about sole proprietorships and general partnerships. These are going to be your quickest and the easiest ways to start business. So a sole proprietorship is one person doing business for profit. Like I said, quick and easy, there's no formal state filing or registration requirements. Like all businesses, you need a business name. My name is John Doe and you want to open up a cookie shop. That's fine. You name is John Doe. You're good to go. Don't want to name it John Doe. Maybe think the cookie dough sounds <laughs> that much better. For that, you will have to file a fictitious name with the state of Florida that costs about $50. Step three is needing a licensing or permits or any registrations with the state. So, electricians, CPAs, cosmetology, things like that. You can go on to myfloridalicense.com and they actually have a button that says, Do I need a license? Let me, let me just say something. These PowerPoint slides, we're going to um, give them to Dr. Hollis, who can make them available to you. So you don't need to take them. Yeah, you don't have to worry okay. about frantic. Okay. Okay. You don't have to be frantically ready. I should have said that. You Sorry. We're going to give you the whole presentation. No, 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 no. So we just want you to take it in and be ready to ask questions so you can get back today. <laughs> <laughs> Is you're going to want to get an EIN, which is your employer identification number, and that is of your business's social security number for tax purposes, of course. That helps you get it. So, next, you have general partnerships. These are two or more people going to business together for profit. Again, like the sole proprietorship, you're not going to have state filing requirements either. The steps here very similar to a sole proprietorship. You still need your business name. It does not need your name. You still need a fictitious name. Third, it's drafting side of partnership agreement. This is not required, but it's 
where you go into business with someone, you're going to want to know who owns, how much, how you guys want to go, you know, get to the issues before there's any issues. Like marriage counseling. And still licensing and the EIN number as well. So important things to consider. Like I said, this is a cheap, easy way to just start a business. All you need to do is start a business. But you will be logical because you're not like an LLC or a corporation. We can discuss the liability for this. You need a sole proprietorship. Since there's just one of you, you don't have sole liability. What does that mean? It means your cookie shop. Somebody gets food for you. They're going to sue you. All your assets are in the necklace. Same thing with the general partnership. It says joint and separate. So John and Mary go into business together. Mary does something. They can still sue John. So both will be up line. And both of you have to get that. And then let's see. Go on to the corporations. So one of the biggest problems in this case is liability. Businesses will incur debt to get creditors. If corporations have limited liabilities companies, they offer great protections for these owners by limiting their personal liability. There's no personal liability which you are in compliance with all these rules. But you must be able to distinguish your corporate assets from your personal assets. I put this in perspective, we'll give you an example. A corporation will incur 20000 in debt, but only has $10,000 in assets. Creditors will be able to collect $10,000 in assets, but they will not be able to get personal assets from the corporation. However, if an individual incurs $20,000 in debt, they will be able to collect from the car and other personal assets. Forming a floor corporation. It's do several things. They submit the articles of incorporation. Once the Department of State approves the corporation exists, this will include the name, the name and the address of the corporation. Then you will hold an organizational meeting with the directors and not the bylaws. Bylaws are private, unlike the articles of incorporation. It can be adopted by the incorporators and the directors. Thus, the article strictly reserves its power to shareholders. The bylaws and the articles conflict, the articles we control. Now, the key participants, the shareholders, are the owners of the company, and the ownership reflects how much stock they have. The directors let think of them as the captains of the ship. They have the upper level management, decision making. They have duties, the duty of care, good faith, and loyalty. And the officers usually run the day to day operations with specific tasks and duties. That are often outlined in the violence. Now stop, it's you and everybody's favor, but bear with me. That represents the ownership in a company. The company will usually raise capital by either selling its shares or in the You're probably about 15 slides before that. There we go, stop. So maybe you could go to move the pages while he talks. Do you want him to click the pages for you? Oh, no, no, I think I got it now. Okay. So glad you're here. Okay, never a dull moment. So stop. That represents the ownership in a company. The company will usually raise capital by either selling shares or incurring, incurring debt. A key word would be issuance. That's when a corporation sells its own shares. Outstanding shares. These are the shares that the company has issued and not backed back, bought back in our position with the shareholders. 
Now, preemptive rights, these are very important. They're the right of the current shareholders to buy and maintain the same percentage of ownership and avoid the dilution of their shares. Now, this is only available if it is in the Articles of Incorporation. All right, piercing the corporate veil. This is a very important exception to the rule. Now, normally you don't have personal liability. However, this corporate liability shield will be disregarded, or can be disregarded by the courts if you stop complying with the corporate formalities. Now, this would include commingling the personal and corporate funds. You are no longer, longer able to distinguish between the two. The shareholders, the directors, now have personal assets to be accessible. Now, an example of this, the plaintiff wants to go after the owners of the company. And the company has not been compliant with the formal corporation appliances. So why would the courts allow for this corporate tax shield? And what makes sense? Its purpose is to promote the businesses and the corporations. And if they stop complying with these corporate formalities, they will be disregarded. Now, luckily, there's more advantages and disadvantages than a corporation, so there's no need to sweat. <laughs> now, obviously, you have limited liability, and they're relatively easy to set up. And also, it'll give you a lot of credibility. Because the doing business with an individual, if you're incorporated, it kind of gives you a sense of purpose and credibility. People will be more likely to invest if they have limited risk, so you're more likely to have shareholders. Additionally, they have infinite duration, and it's very easy to raise capital to sell it to ownership. Any natural person or entity can be incorporated. It's very important that support residency is not required. And obviously, there's a lot of tax benefits, but one of the downsides is very bureaucratic and has a lot of compliance requirements. And businesses often ignore them, which can get them in trouble. Now, Florida limited liability. This is very common, and you can set it up for any legal purpose. You must register with the state of Florida, and it can be sued or sued. You can adopt an operating agreement, but it's not necessary. The articles can provide for specific details that give the members rights and obligations, but in any of these, the state will have default rules. You cannot, however, waive the duty of good faith, care, and fiduciary duty. And the default rules are the Florida Revised Limited Liability Company Act. The formation, relatively simple process. You file the articles of incorporation with the Department of State. You must have the principal office and the mailing address in there to receive the official correspondence. Additionally, you must have a registered agent the registered office, and this can be the same both above. Most importantly, you have to have limited liability company in the name. This gives transparency for any business or organization that you're doing business with that you have limited liability. Now, so advantages and disadvantages of limited liability. They are very simple to form, and they're relatively easy to maintain. They can give it can be taxable partnership or a corporation, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility. And like a corporation, the corporate assets are increased, but the members are shielded from the personal liability. Now, the wrongful acts done by the members, obviously, outside of their corporate capacity as an officer and directors, you can still be liable for that. If you do something bad, you're going to be liable. And it gives you certain credibility. Again, the corporation sees that when you're incorporated, you're taking your business seriously. It's infinite duration, so it'll last forever. And this is something that's very important. You can owe title to property. And then it gives you a lot of flexible flexibility. Unlike a corporate corporation, there's not as many compliance requirements, so you're able to run your business as you see fit. That's fun. Setting their business with the state of Florida, specifically on the incorporation. Um, okay. 
Okay, and finally, you know, our goals and motivations is first step in setting up your uh, your business or no organization or corporation. Um, approval of this document secures your corporate name and creates legal entity of the corporation. Uh, only after that approval can the, the corporation apply for tax IDs, obtain business license, and sign contracts and otherwise conduct business. Section 607. Uh, 202 of the Florida statutes covers the minimum requirements for flag filing the article of the corporation. So, required provisions that are necessary for the articles of the corporation include the corporation name, and some place of business, and a mailing address, incorporator's name and address, stock shares, and registered agent uh, name and address. Corporation name. The name must be distinguishable. Uh, on the records of the Department of State, um, you must conduct a preliminary uh, search by the name before submitting your document. The name must include corporation, company, or Inc. and co. Uh, co. Do not use or assume a name that is uh, approved uh, until you're filing a document for the E Division of Corporations. Next, we have the principal place of business and mailing address. This should state the Street address of the corporation's principal office and the corporation's mailing address, if different from the principal office uh, address. Uh, we, this is where your company's owners and managers meet to make important business decisions, but it uh, doesn't have to be the location where the work is conducted every day. Appeal boxes, all sorts. Next, we have the incorporator's name and address. The incorporator is the one filed in the document. Must include the name of each incorporator. One incorporator is sufficient, but you may have more and must be signed by at least one person. Next, we have stock shares. Must set forth any classes of shares and series of shares within any class and must set the number of shares of each class and series to be issued. There must be at least one stock issue. Um, a CPA and a corporate attorney uh, should be contacted if you have any more questions about stock shares. Next, we have the registered uh, name and address. The individual legal entity that will accept the service of process, which means uh, if you're being sued, the papers that must be serviced to them uh, on behalf of the business entity is the registered agent. The registered officer or office is the address where the registered agent is located during normal business hours. An entity cannot serve as its own registered agent. The registered agent must have a physical street address in Florida, and the police do not. Uh, list the PO box for this specific construction. Some optional provisions that are included into the articles of incorporation but are not necessary uh, are the corporate purpose, officer and director, and preemptive rights. Corporate purpose, uh, corporations are not required to list a uh, purpose but may do so. It's any and all lawful business is acceptable for this uh, instruction. Next, we have the officer and director, the names and the street address. Of the officers and directors are optional. An officer can be a business or a person. Uh, a director cannot be a business entity. However, an individual or a principal associated with the business may serve as the registered agent. Oh, no, that was um, the effective date. The corporation's ex uh, existence begins on a date. The division or corporation of corporation receives and files your articles, unless your articles specify an acceptable uh, alternate effective date. Uh, corporation may, can specify an effective date that is no more than five business days prior to or 90 days after the date the document is received by the office. Processing fees for the articles of incorporation are 35 for articles of, uh, for a or corporation, um, and it's supposed to be 125 for the articles of uh, organization for an LLC. We have missed so missed that. Benefits of a fictitious name. It gives you the ability to establish a professional uh, business brand under a name that will click with customers. It enables a sole proprietor or partners in a partnership to open a business account for receiving and making payments through their company. It will help you control costs and minimize the amount of paperwork compliance tasks associated with expanding your LLC or corporation. Fictitious name registration. A fictitious name may not contain a business entity suffix or indicator, such as corporation, incorporated, limited liability, and so on. 
Uh, if you are not a financial institute, you cannot use the words bank, banker, trust, company, savings bank, or credit union, or similar words of import. Fictitious name must be advertised in a newspaper in the county in which the principal place of business uh, of the registrate is or will be located. The term for a fictitious name under this section shall be valid for a period beginning on the date of registration or re-registration. It expires on the 31st of the fifth calendar year. Renewal for the fictitious name uh, shall occur on January 1st or on before 30, no, December 31st of the expiration year. Renewal is continued for five years. And the processing fees for registered uh, registering a fictitious name is fifty dollars, and for renewal is fifty dollars. I see that Professor Cass going over in his slides. <laughs> Yeah. So, in addition to um, operating without an entity, such as a uh, sole proprietorship, or two or more people are doing a general partnership, or through a human corporation or an LLC, human liability company, there's other opportunities, and we don't, we didn't include them all. There's also limited partnerships, um, limited things. So there's other things, but two things uh, that we want to talk about today are nonprofit corporations and social purpose corporations. And this was uh, a slide deck prepared by Anna Eskenazi, uh, one of our students, who uh, would make it today. So I'm going to cover for her. What's a nonprofit corporation? It's a corporation uh, that is not organized primarily to make a profit. And uh, churches are nonprofits, uh, uh, United Way is a nonprofit, American Cancer Society is a nonprofit. Plenty of things are nonprofit, but it's not a designed to be a profit making enterprise. Uh, it's a legal entity dedicated to furthering a specific social cause or a shared goal or mission. And, uh, and a nonprofit can become tax exempt by making an application to the IRS for tax exempt status. What does that uh, mean? It means two things. Number one, it means that if there are some profits in the company, they're not going to be taxed or, or I don't want to get too much in tax rules, but generally it doesn't take income taxes. But secondly, if somebody gives a contribution to a nonprofit organization, sometimes they're called 501c3 organizations, you can take a tax deduction on your personal income tax return. So most charitable organizations apply to the IRS for taxes and status. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Forming a nonprofit corporation is just another type of corporation under foreign law, and, it, it, and it's done the exact same way that Claudio explained for a for profit corporation, but it's not for profit. But there's a couple changes. In your arms of incorporation, you are required to specify what the corporate purpose is. It may be to create a homeless shelter. Uh, maybe for religious reasons, it may be, you know, to uh, whatever. The board of directors has to be uh, specified in a nonprofit. You need at least three directors. In a regular corporation, you need only at least one member of the board of directors. And you also have to talk about how the directors are going to be elected in the articles. It can be very simple. You can simply say, as provided in the bylaws. Or you can specify right in your article of incorporation, but it might be that, uh, for example, a typical church will have members, you're a member of the church, and maybe the members have an annual meeting and vote for the directors. So you say, you know, voted upon by the members at the annual meeting. It may be that you don't have members, like the United Way doesn't have members, but it's voted upon by the board of um, directors. Would Elect the new people, you specify that. So you got to have a few more things in your argument. Apply for 501c3 status with the IRS. There's an application form that the IRS has called Form 1023. And uh, just a tax form. 
but if your organization's gross receipts are under $50,000 per year and it's expected for the first five years, you can use a form called the 1023 EC. And if you're familiar with tax forms, usually like there's a 1040 form, which you file next week, uh, but there's also the 1040 EZ, which is a less complicated, simpler return. And for smaller charities, you if you eligible, you file the 1023 EC. It's quicker, it's easier to do. And we've formed a few nonprofits over the years. I think we've done three of them in the last two years. We've all used the 1023 EZ and they get approved pretty quickly. After you, uh, you see, and what will happen is if the IRS approves it, and unfortunately everyone's been approved for us, uh, that uh, you're going to get a letter saying we have determined that you are uh, tax exempt uh, and uh, and you're a tax exempt organization. What do you have to do then? Well, every year you have to file a tax return, a, a information return, not a tax return, and it's called Form 990. And there's different. Uh, it's like a 1040, but it's just an information return showing what your revenues, expenses, and the balance sheet was. If you're small enough. You can do it as on as little as a postcard. You just check the boxes. You haven't got money for yourself. You qualify. You met certain requirements. Just check a couple boxes. Uh, you're required to maintain certain records under the tax laws. Uh, with that new current. And you have to continue operating in accordance with the corporate purpose you put in your exemption such so as you're going to be a church and now you're running a cookie store <laughs> you know it's not a good thing uh, that's not to say that a, a church can't have a cookie sale and 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 there may be profits on that if you have to pay taxes but i don't want to get into too much of that but you know there's always fundraisers but uh usually they're for non-profit purposes you may Charge for the cookies, but support the school or whatever. But uh, I'm well, oh, a couple other things. Uh, in order to get nonprofit status, a tax exempt status, there's certain things that the IRS requires that you can't engage in lobbying. They don't want you to be involved with political things. Uh, there's no private benefit. The people that form the nonprofit. You, can, you can, can't benefit like a shareholder in a corporation where if there's profits for your money. You can, that doesn't mean you can't get paid a reasonable salary for services you perform. So if you form a nonprofit and you're running the office for it and doing that, and it, let's, I'm making the number up. If X thousand dollars is a reasonable salary for doing that kind of work, you can pay yourself up that X thousands of dollars. But you can't pay yourself like five times, you know, X thousand dollars. You can pay yourself a reasonable salary, uh, pay to universities more expenses. You can't participate in political campaigns. And the unrelated business income, like cookie sales, if you're doing a cookie sale once a year at the church, that's fine. If you set up a cookie store in the mall, that's uh, going to be perhaps not necessarily the right thing to do. Or another way, it's going to be taxed that that money. Um, if you're a nonprofit, if you're asking for contributions, soliciting contributions, which pretty much every nonprofit does, you need to. There's a department in the state government of Florida called the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. The initials are FDACS, and they regulate charities in the state of Florida, and there's similar departments in other states of the United States. And uh, you need to be licensed or registered with the Florida Department of uh, Agriculture and Consumer Services, or if you're doing less, if you're expecting revenue is less than $25,000 in a year, you can be exempt. You still need to file a, an exemption application. And uh, the clients we've had, which are relatively small charities, um, have all filed the exemption application. It's a pretty simple thing. Uh, 
and the link for a registration application is right here, or for the small registration, the exemption is right there. You go on, it's a simple form. You do need to look at a little financial statement in there of your expected revenues for the year. It's over 25,000. You need the long form, under 25,000, you use the short form. If you apply on the short form and later on you go over, to, let's say you think you're going to only do 25,000 and three quarters of the way through the year, you, you raise more money. It's a good thing. But you got 30 days to go in and amend your form by filing a registration. And putting it in the long form. But the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services can be regulated all charities. Uh, as we solicitate, and, and when you're soliciting, you have to have a statutorily required disclosure. It's in the statutes. It's just a little, if, you, if you've ever looked at charitable solicitation, sometimes in the fine print at the bottom, it says this thing is not affiliated with the Florida Department, but uh, if you have any questions about the charity, here's the number, website, and you can get information about the charity off. You go on uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and there's a box for check a charity. Put that box, you can put the name of the charity in, you get information about it, the financial statements that they filed, and find out how much of the money is going for programming, how much is going for administration, uh, things like that. Uh, you also have to have the uh, phone number of the company if they've got questions, find out information. So you got to have a little legend on these things. It's usually small print at the bottom, but it's, it's got to be on everything. Annually, they're going to send you a renewal form, similar to the last year's form, your application form, the year registration form, or the exemption form. You have to file that. And you need a financial statement. But if you've already filed a form for 990 with IRS or 990 EC, you can just attach that, and that's your financial statement. So uh, if you're 51C3, filing that form already with the IRS, you can just attach that to your annual renewal. Social purpose corporations. This is interesting. It's a new thing under Florida law in the last seven years, and we've had a number of our clients want to do it. What is a social purpose corporation? It's a corporation, but you have a social purpose aspect. It's a profit-making corporation. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've heard, and I don't know if they're a Florida, they're not a Florida social purpose corporation, but anybody heard of Tom Shoes? Show the hands of Tom Shoes. What is, how do they advertise? Or what do they do that's special about Tom Shoes other than the shoe? They donate a pair of shoes. They donate a pair of shoes. They're donating a shoe to a homeless shelter or somebody. So you purchase it and they're, they're doing some sort of social purpose. They're trying to do something. And that's exactly what a social purpose corporation does. And some people want to do business with, if you're going to buy a pair of shoes and say, wait a second, I'll buy from Tom shoes. I know when I buy that $30 pair of shoes, somebody in a homeless shelter is getting a pair of shoes. You may be more apt to do business with them. And, and that's what a social purpose corporation is. And it's a for profit corporation. You can earn a profit. A social purpose also paid and pursue both social financial goals and in a for profit context. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what's involved. It's the same as a regular corporation. Except that, except that you have to designate in your article of incorporation your social purpose. So we have well, one of our clients is their social purpose, and it can be anything that better society or alleviates a harm. It can be for economic benefit. It can be for artistic, charitable, religious, scientific purposes. One one of our social purpose corporations is to assist. Um, uh, women who have been compromised in some, they're really getting into like sex trafficking, but getting them back into society, providing job training, providing food assistance, whatever. But that's who, that's what she wanted to. And that's, that's what that company is. Uh, it can be anything. A social purpose corporation can be, we've got one that's, um, um, it is, 
assisting uh, inner city youth in uh, skills development and job training, like people in middle school and high school to, to compare them to the workforce. But they can still be a profit making organization. They could have done it as a nonprofit, and that's typically what was done, but you can do it as a for profit, but you've got a social purpose as well. And uh, what happens there is that your articles of incorporation are just like what Claudio said for a for, for profit, but they must state the company is a social purpose corporation right in the articles and include one or more specific public benefits. So you say you're a social purpose corporation and our specific public benefit is training you with you know, for skills development or whatever you want, you can say whatever you want, but you've got to say it in there in your article of incorporation. It's a matter of public benefit. And here's what it means public benefit, this is a right from the statute, although we shortened it, means a positive effect for the minimization of negative effects on the environment or one or more categories of persons or entities other than shareholders of an artistic, charitable, educational, cultural, literary. Religious, social, ecological, or scientific nature. It's pretty broad. And you just, and uh, there's a special form for filing it. And this is where you get that form right off of uh, Sunbiz, which is the Florida Secretary of State. And, you know, nowadays people are much more socially conscious. It's, it, it can be a positive aspect for your business as a marketing thing, but you got to be accountable for it. So there's got to be somebody in your corporation, uh, either what's called a benefit director or a benefit officer, or if you don't have that position in your company, the board of directors is responsible, and uh, they must consider the, when they're making decisions about what the company is going to do, they have to consider the effects of any corporate action or inaction on the specified public purpose of the company's ability to accomplish its specific public benefits. So if Tom Shoes decides um, that they're, what they're doing is giving a free shoe to the homeless every time they sell one, and now somebody at the company said, well, it costs us a ton of money. Let's just drop that. That's <laughs> the The directors have to... They, they must consider any corporate action, whether that makes, you know, is consistent. And that's not to say they couldn't modify it or maybe we're going to do one shoe for every two, whatever, but they've got to think about this. And uh, they also have to prepare an annual report. Most every corporation has to file an annual financial report, but they also have to submit a social purpose. Uh, to all shareholders who post on the website an annual benefit report where they talk about what their social purpose was, how they achieved it, things that caused them not to achieve it, or what they're trying to do better. It's a bunch of things they've got to talk about. So you got to be accountable for it. So that's another opportunity or option that you may have if you start a business that you're going to have a societal impact. You might want to form a social purpose. But you got to walk the walk, including instead of just talking to talk. Corporate governance, see them. By the way, these slides were put together by Anna. I'm just a mouthful. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Just one second. Bear with me when I get set up. See, we also have it on that screen there. You can yeah. see it. It's just the arrows. Yeah. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, one first, for having us here. Uh, and as the slide already said, my name is Stephen Daly, professor. We're all third year graduating students. So, Two weeks left. Two weeks left, and then I'm done. Maybe you guys take no bars. I'm going to be positive ciphers. Look at the bright side of this one. Silver lining center. Okay, so 
it is not going to come to you as a surprise. I'm going to talk about corporate governance. So, corporate governance. You want me to put the slides for you? No, no, it's fine, Professor. I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, corporate governance. That's what I'm here to talk about. Oh, yeah. So, another thing about law school, we're going to give you the whole law school experience in one, one little spell swoop here. So, basically, the law school experience is you show up and they expect you to do everything. Basically, you're the one that's like, you're the one that teaches class. So, I'm not really doing anything today, you guys. Uh, so, if I may ask the class, what does corporate governance do to you, man? And that's law school right there. What is your name? Trisha. Trisha, what do you think You know what? I'm going to take my place. So, yeah, that's exactly correct. And I'm going to read something to you, and this will come to you anytime I read something to you. So, the least worthy. Corporate covered is a system of rules and practices, uh, processes by which in business is directed and controlled. Essentially, it involves the interests of companies, stakeholders, shareholders, and etc. Et et so, Trish, uh, that was it. I got nothing else. <laughs> I got nothing else. I think the easiest way to remember things, I like to, I like to put everything into small bites. What you need to know about corporate governance is all it is is everything that your stakeholders need to know or need to agree to to run the business. That being said, caveat emptor is always in accordance with the laws of the state. The state has some regulations about uh, it actually has you know very wordy statutes. I'll have it for you on the last slide, but they only cover the you are allowed to need to invest to run your business. So quickly, stakeholders. My colleagues have already talked about the different um, types of entities that you can create. So your primary stakeholders, the corporation or shareholders, and then of course in the C or the members, and then in a partnership. I don't know, somebody tell me what it's gonna be in a partnership. You know what? I'll just take your okay. okay, so now you know who the stakeholders are. So, obviously, we're talking about agreements. We break it down into two spaces what happens before you form a company, and what happens when you legally form an entity that is now in your business. Okay, so the first one, the first space, you've got an idea. I don't know what it is. I'm sure it's a fantastic idea. <laughs> you have a friend. He has money to help you and your idea to the market. You have another friend. He has the technical know-how. You put together your idea. You three get together, and now you decide to start a business. What do you guys put? One person has put in financing. A person has put in the vision, sweat equity. Another person is putting in the technical know how you're building, your which it is, amazing, and it is starting. Okay. Now you're making money, you're making profit. How do you decide who gets what? Who owns how much? Was it whose equity, for lack of a better term, sweat? Financial or otherwise is worth more. So, in order to avoid these problems, I think you, I think I see, I heard a few groans earlier when you talked about shares and things. So, I'm guessing you're all following, following in your head stories. It's probably happening to you already. I can see your nods in the back. Um, what we do in pre formation, as the slide says, is a founder's agreement. And a founder's agreement is an informal document and it covers all the corporate governances you need, just pretty much the steps. Who's going to get what share? Who has what control of what parts of the company? How do we interact with each other? Do we vote each other out? Do we vote on every decision? Except that I say, it's all covered. Why is this important? I mean, I, I would say often overlooked, but 
uh, let's face it, ninety nine percent of people who form companies don't come in and turn into a founder agreement. Even even uh, unicorn level startups with like PC capital funding sometimes fail to do this. Sometimes fail to do this. Um, and of course, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but that's the point of the story. <laughs> I don't remember his name. I don't know what his name was. Uh, he owned ten percent of Apple computers. This was pre-formation. Yeah, I, he sold it to his partners for about eight hundred bucks. So, <laughs> six hundred. Was it six hundred? Yeah. Wow. Maybe just for the months. Just <laughs> so. <laughs> so yeah, think about that. For a second. You own ten percent of the most popular corporation on the planet. Yes, you do. All right, so that's the founders. It's something that you can put together. And again, this is something that Flinny can help you with, or some counsel, but obviously you have to think of these things before you start doing before you actually start doing it. Because by that time it's too late. By that time, everybody's mentally invested in what they're owed. And I promise you, your head is not the same what's in the other person's head. So skipping right to you, okay, you've okay, you get a founders, you bring you did your thing, okay, you're good. But now you've got it incorporated. You're going to decide what kind of entity we put together. And uh, under those entities, we basically have, uh, we name the corporate governance documents different things. So if you're in a corporation, you have bylaws. Again, this is going to cover all those things that we talked about. You know, who owns what? Titles and positions and responsibilities. How do we vote? How does the company make a decision together? How do we, you know, one of the biggest ones that comes up is how do we get rid of someone who we don't want to be? <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it's a thing, it happens. Uh, I hate to, you know, put it so bluntly, but that's how it is. Uh, I put in a shareholders agreement with a sub agreement of uh, bylaws, which is usually between just the shareholders and the corporation. So you may have persons who are on your board of directors, executive officers, which have some say, may not have shares in the company. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then you're limited by the way. These have operating agreements. Again, they cover the basic fundamentals. And uh, partnership agreements, as Lee said, very good idea to have. Because this is, this is a most restrictive to least restrictive sort of state. Uh, restrictive, but the restrictive is a bad word, but basically this one, you have a really great partnership. You have a one that's a three Corporation was a lot of components, so it was great levels. All right. That being said, I covered a few of these issues. Let's, let's talk about them in general. I I'd be willing to listen to your stories, but after some you know, key issues that you're going to run across, these are the ones you're going to get. These slides, so you don't need to write them down. It's usually share allocations. How much was I expecting for my share of the work or my share of the initial investment? That kind of thing. Or, so you agreed to that uh, already. How do I give my shares to, I don't know, my children or, you know, somebody that I want to give my shares to? I mean, it's a company or a corporation or a partnership and stand in my way and I'm going to be transferring my shares. All these things have been dealt with. Um, and of course, voting issues, leadership, that goes with us. The big one I think is company records. So company records, what do I need by that? Why is that such a problem? Okay. Uh, so this is where, this is where, so in my limited experience, as a legal one, uh, I, I personally dealt with a client, formed a corporation, 10, 12 years ago. Couple of, um, shall we say, very intelligent, very scrappy, can do results oriented people, which I think probably most people in this room are. Uh, I'll tell you that I'm like the first one that says, hey, let's not waste time on things that don't matter. Unfortunately, you're starting your business, over bylaws or something that sound like they don't matter. You know, like, I have to, I have to get the product. Put together. I have to get this prototype with a picture. We don't get the money. Pull some bylaws off of Google, set me up, and let's get started. Okay, that works. It can happen. It happens more than you think. 
But in this case, what they did, that's the bylaws, Google signed them and said, okay, we're in business. All right, no problem. Uh, 12 years goes by. The bylaws have been sitting on a shelf somewhere. Mind you, these bylaws are telling you everything that your company is supposed to do, staying compliance. Uh, how to keep minutes of your meetings, how to properly issue shares of stocks, how to, you know, uh, make decrees uh, that are provided uh, better to compliant with com company structure. So, 12 years later, the two partners decide they're going to try this. And it's fairly amicable. So one partner intends to sign all the shares for the group. And I say partner, but really we're talking about two shareholders in a corporation. Um, he's going to sign over their shares. Well, guess what? They never filed, they never filed certificates for the shares. So technically the shares don't exist. <laughs> um, the ownership of the shares and various other agreements that they had in between each other, they leave in number, as in I own 51, you own 49, wait, the other way around, that's it. Mm. So, um, there are no minutes, obviously, for meetings, I could go on and on. These things were put in the story. That's, that's the moral of the story. What would have been a very simple signing, properly executed share certificate to hand over, and now we are divested. Let's speak of the thing. I don't want to say that. I'm going to be very careful with that. It's going to be probably a very difficult documented process where we have to backtrack and follow steps that the bylaws of the sign required each of the shareholders to do in order to execute the things that they to execute. And, um, well, you're thinking, what is the, what is the point? Well, 12 years ago, we got our We've gotten, we're in the present now. We're still in the stuff. Uh, let us sign over the shares. Who cares what you do because you set out? Let's get this over and done with the one, two signature. That way we don't have to draw corporate edicts that dictate the shares now in lieu of not having been set according to the bylaws and now being, you know, uh, brought into, uh, sorry. Certification for X amount of I'm going into too much detail. But my point being is that what would have been a very simple transfer of the two people is now very complicated. Multiple document process that's that's taking up a lot of their time. Of course, since we this is out of bread and butter, I guess that's we, we can't say. So, I think what you also wanted to say was that you know in terms of getting shares one by the other, you probably could have done it simple. But then if later on you now own all the company, right. somebody wants to buy in. Right. Well that was the thing. That was the that was the not the question. Ultimately, in order for this, in order for the no one to be challenged, because yes, we could make it simple, but in order for there not to be a challenge at the end of the day for somebody changing their minds. Do you want to shoot shares? Is there any shares to be invited? I didn't sign up my shares properly. You know what? I'll put it back. Oh, by the way, you buy yourself now and I'm going to come to you with 10 million a year revenue? Yeah, I deserve it. So um, that was the case. You have, we're doing it, and it's taking a longer process because we want there to be no challenges in the future. And that's why you want to have important governance documents ahead of time. Follow your corporate documents, maintain accurate company records, according to your bylaws, operating agreements, partnership agreements, whatever you have to do. I mentioned intellectual property uh, protections because that's uh, one asset that uh, businesses, startups often overlook, and that's something that's usually, I mean, they overlook the assets themselves, but obviously, if you're overlooking the assets, so you're overlooking. Incorporating protections for those assets in your bonds. So, incorporate those social protections into your bond and bonds, operating agreements, etc. And the final final point that I have to make is, is corporate counsel. You know what you're thinking? You're thinking, here's a guy, he's going to do law school, he's a lawyer, he's advising that you should hire a lawyer. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, gee, you know, self interest very much. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is that, you know, there are lots of resources, pretty quick 
Burger Entrepreneur Clinic. Um, and maybe, yes, you might have to pay someone for a small uh, to do some legal work to it. But it will save you so much money in the past in the future that I can't emphasize it enough. And finally, in case anyone uh, wants to do some light reading tonight, <laughs> I've included the chapters of the four statutes that work. I'm going to send you all the PowerPoints. Yeah. And the, uh, and a handy dandy link for Sabbath 36. So you can check that out later tonight. It's your four. Um, thank you for your time. And now, uh, you know, call my colleague Alex. I can feel free to get something from the back. Don't forget. Good job. Thank you. Because some of us love law. We know it can be really tedious to learn. I love having the different individuals because it keeps it interesting and more and more entertaining. Well, since even though it's the climax, I guess I'm the falling action. But... <laughs> yeah, the closer. <laughs> so the first thing that I read, uh, you have to get your ID number. It's specifically going to be needed uh, to pay your uh, Social Security and Medicare taxes and all the taxes for your employees. So that's also that's going to be required for any business entity, except maybe for sole proprietorship. They don't have any employees. But it's still a good thing to have for later if you have to hire them. It's also required to uh, register for sales tax. So if your business sells goods, you're going to need that. And you can register at um, the website that's provided here. It's at the IRS. Uh, registering for your sales tax. So who needs to register? Uh, basically, if you sell any kind of item at retail, you're going to need to register at grocery stores, prescriptions, or exemptions. But for most any kind of goods you're selling, you're going to do that. For manufacturing or producing goods, you need to sell to register for sales tax. Uh, renting or leasing property uh, for six months or more. And if you're providing uh, taxable services, which is commercial cleaning and such. Um, so, how do you register? You can uh, register online at the link provided in the Florida Department of Revenue. Uh, there's all kind of information you're going to need to register for a sales tax program. Um, beginning the way this tax will business activity. So, when you start it, um, you're going to need your EIA number, as I mentioned before. Um, the top here, you have to know the type of business entity that you own. And then, um, amongst everything else is listed here. But they have information that's available and I'll explain the detail later in the game. So I'm to everyone's favorite office tax. Is everyone wants a part of the money you you go. So sole proprietorships, partnerships, and LLC all have actual taxes. Well LLC by default. They can actually choose different taxes if you want to. Uh, so what's passed in taxes? Basically it's gonna mean that they're gonna the entity itself doesn't really um, exist for tax purposes. It's going to go to all the owners. So all the income they generate, the owners are going to have to um, pay taxes on. It's going to be divided by the percentage of ownership or the share of the company. And um, they're going to report on a form 1040 based off of the percentage of share. All business income taxes are reported on a Schedule C with personal tax return at the end of the year. That's for um, sole proprietorships. Uh, taxes must be paid even if profits are used to grow the business or not distributed. What this means is that even if you're using the money to grow the business or have it distributed to all the owners, they still have to pay taxes on the generated money. So one of the reasons why people are like investing in LLCs and other small businesses like this, I mean, it's because they have to pay taxes on any money that you generate, even if you're not getting it. So, in any case, imagine that. Uh, in any case, uh, and then it loads the different tax forms that the other entities will have to fill out for the members. So, a uh, big alternative to uh, this, which is why investors like it, is a C corporation. C corporations keep all the profit within the company, 
as such, they get taxed at a 21% tax rate right now. Of course, that can change depending on what the IRS decides to do. Um, and another big benefit is a C corporation can actually choose its own fiscal uh, year for tax purposes. So if there's some reason you want to go from May to May instead of from January you know, to December or such, you can which can be uh, actually a pretty big benefit depending on when you're generating money for tax purposes. Um, retain, any kind of retained earnings can be uh, distributed to uh, owners via dividends, which they didn't pay taxes on. So this is what they call double taxation. So of course the corporation is paying 21% tax on all their earnings. And as they distribute to um, the actual, the shareholders of the owners, then they have to pay taxes on their own forced earnings. So S election, the eligible entities for this is an LLC and a C corporation. But an S election basically is, is it's going to make everything go through path through income again. So if you don't like it, if you want to have a C corporation, but you don't want to pay twenty one percent taxes separately, and you only have double tax, you can do this. Or if you're an LLC and you want this taxation, uh, the big benefit and why people like to do this is that. You know, the owners have uh, pay the owners don't have to pay us uh, self-employment taxes on um, income that uh, the company generates. So we have to do for their own salary. Now the IRS regulates that pretty heavily since it's a pretty not well known tax break. So you have to pay yourself a reasonable income for whatever you're doing. That's the key word again for like non profits. Um but any of the other money that you're generating as a company, you actually don't have to pay a self employment tax on, which can save a little bit of money. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions that come with uh, taking an isolation. I uh, only have 100 shareholders, so it limits how much money you can uh, raise in capital. Um, you can only have one type of stock, but you can have voting and non voting shares. But it takes away a lot of the financing opportunities that a seaport can provide. Uh, only U.S. citizens or permanent residents can actually be shareholders, so you can't go overseas. Uh, C corporations uh, and partnerships and multiple member LLCs cannot be shareholders, meaning that it actually has to be a person. There's a few exceptions to this. There's specific kinds of trust and stuff that you can talk to, uh, like the bank or a tax advisor, CPA. Uh, the deadline to file for the election is uh, two months and 15 days from the start of the fiscal year. It's usually March 15th, if you're following the normal fiscal calendar. But again, a C corporation can choose their own fiscal calendar. So if their tax year ends in March or something, it's two months and 15 days from uh, the end of their year. Like just being direct one day. Uh, sometimes you've heard the buzzword S Corp. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a company that is directly tax funded. Subchapter X. It's not a state law concept. It's just S Corp means you're being taxed on your subchapter X, which is what he's talking about. Yeah. And an LLC can also choose to be taxed as a C corporation. That's uh, as mentioned before. Uh, other regulations that they're going to have to do from court compliance. Uh, we need to, again, if you're in a fictitious name, I think a lot of people forget to do that. Uh, so that's every five years. Instructions how to do that is provided on the website that I posted on PowerPoint. Uh, another thing that people tend to forget about is registered agent has to continually retain uh, a state residence office. And they really expect someone to be there if they have forms and stuff to file to the registered agent. And if they're not, they can come back to the technically. Uh, another thing that corporations have to do is file an annual report, which was mentioned before. Uh, the deadline is uh, May 1st of each year, and there's a $400 penalty if it's filed late. And if it's not filed by September 1st, the entity is automatically dissolved by the state of Florida. So they really need to file an annual report. By the way, you can, you can reinstate yourself. It's going to cost you more money. Yeah, it gets very expensive. Uh, another thing that you really have to do is retain corporate records. This is the uh, nightmare part of uh, forming a corporation. 
Although it gives a benefit, you have to do that within a current copy of your articles of incorporation, your bylaws. So you can't just change them and not report them. Uh, already made communication within the last three years from shareholders and their classes of share. Uh, minutes of your meetings. Uh, this is going to be between uh, the shareholders, board of directors, uh, and board committees that you form. Uh, a list of all names and business street addresses of the current directors and officers. So all your directors and officers you have to correct where they are. Um, a list of shareholders and the shares they own and alphabetic order and, and, and separate between classes. And it's also so it's so this is much information for that you can probably build in the minute book. So this is, you have to be very nice. And again, from going back to the previous point, if you don't contain everything appropriately like this, is you can actually end up getting uh, my book, your library protection can fall apart. There's an appropriate fail. So you have to really follow up all these corporate teachers. Thank you. I've been teaching a long Thank you, Alfred. Excellent job. Excellent for all of you. Yeah. I've been teaching for a long time. We do we practice this twice as frequently as over this week. It's about 45 minutes. But I found in my teaching career, I keep talking longer and longer. And you guys talk longer than your initial time range, which is fine. Uh, but I want to respect the fact that you all have jobs or places you have to go to about lunch here. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we can do it to an end chat. Uh, Dr. House, I will give it to you. Or we can just be around here till one o'clock to answer questions, you know, informal with the lunch. Break. Does anybody have any questions right now? Yes. I got two. You and then. Yes, sir. Well, legal clinic. I, last year, I used the legal clinic after my, my retirement plan was hatched. So the University of Miami and Law School and the Family Church in New York, they bind together and got my money, which uh, resulted in uh, me retrieving all of my $20,000. The University of Miami is legal clinic. Legal clinic, yes. Right. Well, that's good. I mean, you know. Just so you understand what a clinic is, it's it's an it's an opportunity where students have to be trained, but the the students are doing the work. But the way the rules work in Florida Bar is it's got to be under the direct supervision of a member of the Florida Bar. Okay. So the person in charge of the clinic, in our case, the Bird Clinic is me, but at University of Miami, you're going to have an experienced lawyer working with students who are beyond motivated. This is what they're going to be doing. They are so charged up. And the clinics do a nice job. That's now, they, obviously, students may not have as much experience, but hopefully, between the students and the professor, they can cover things. So, thank you. Yes, the round of names, Tasty Works. That's a big program from the Adams Department. Great. Hey, um, I've seen that some companies use like professional, professional assistant lawyers, the PA, PA. What entity is that? Is that so? Okay. PA is a uh, corporation, but it can be an LLC. It can be a, uh, uh, a PA means professional association, but what it's a professional service corporation. And the P, the uh, PA, PC, PLLC means professional association. What it means is that all of the owners are licensed professionals and there's a list of them but it's any professionals who are licensed by the state of florida for example lawyers have to maintain a license dentists have to maintain a license in florida to practice dental hygienists uh, 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 architects cpas and so if lawyers want to get together and form a corporation i used to be with a firm called Hartman fields PA, it's a corporation, but it was PA means professional association, PC means professional corporations designation. We could have been an LLC, a limited liability company, but we would be called Carlton Fields PLLC. 
and all it signifies is that it's corporation or a limited liability company with limited liability, but it's comprised of professionals in a licensed profession within the state of Florida. There are certain restrictions. In a professional service corporation, the only people that can own it are people that hold a license in that profession. So if Elise and I form a law firm, uh, and she's not yet a member of Florida Bar. She doesn't have a license. She can't have a share ownership. If she becomes a member of the bar, she could own, you know, we can 50 50 shareholders. But right now, she could be an employee of mine, and it could be Stephen Cass PA or whatever I want to call the company's name, like whatever I form it, or, uh, you know, just take some sort of name. But she couldn't own ownership unless she holds the license in that profession. So, if that question it has to do with the, if you say bylaws and governance, since I think uh, one of the professors said that these bylaws sometimes they are you know, on the shelf when nobody remembers them. If someone wanted to sue a corporation or a company, are those bylaws public where I can go and see, well, this is what you said in the very beginning of bylaws and you're not operating according to that now? Uh, they, are, they can be available, but they are not mandated to, to be made public. We said shareholders in the corporation have the right to see those corporate records that uh, Alex had on this slide. Any shareholders who have an inspector bylaw. Somebody outside the company, it's not published. You don't have to put it up on the sun biz or anything. But if there's a lawsuit uh, in the courts, anything that might be relevant to the courts can be obtained through discovery, like through a subpoena or depositions. They may force you to put, you know, a document request in the litigation, even if, if you're going to get into it. No. I, I was just saying, I think what your question was is there a public forum? Is there a public forum and mandated to make them available right. to the public? And they're not, but you can you can get a hold of them and do the process. Just, yeah, so if you're in a, in a litigation, they're going to get your bylaws and they're going to say, wait a second, bylaws say you're going to do this, this, and this, but they do this and this. So maybe you weren't really acting as a corporation. Or maybe, you know, Bylaw said the issue that stock had to do this. We didn't do that. So is that stock out of the issue? Does this guy still have the shares? So I hope that answers your question. Great question. Mm -hmm. What if it's a, that social um, organization? Yeah. What about it? Would they not have an obligation to make the information public as to whether or not they yeah. are operating according to what they're saying? The uh, bylaws, they don't need to. But they have to provide an annual benefit report required by Florida law. They have to send out the financial statements to all their shareholders and the benefit report to shareholders. And if they have a website, they have to post that annual benefit report for three years on the website. So if you're looking to, and again, I, I use Tom Shoes as an example that they may not even Florida Corporation, but if they were a Florida Social Purpose Corp. You could go on the, the Tom Shoes website and see if they're a Florida corporation. They have to have the annual benefit report for last year, the year before, and the year before. And they say, this is what we do. We get 5,000 pairs of shoes, blah, 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 whatever they do. We have any of the answer. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit confused about the fictitious name. Like, what is the purpose if you have an LLC to have a fictitious name? A fictitious name is any name other than your corporate name. So, Onis, explain that with your corporate name. Let's bring that slide up. Okay. And, and it ties into, by the way, the registered agent. It's, it's very important for registered agent purposes. Okay. The registered agent is the person, if somebody wants to sue a corporate and, and sue anybody, they file it. Uh, a um, they file a lawsuit. They go down. They file a complaint. They bring it down to Broward County Courthouse. 
they say, I am suing so-and-so. And how does that suit actually start to file it? Then they give it to the sheriff. Now, the process server comes out and hands the suit papers to the person name. Okay? So use that example and tell me that John Bell owns a business of cooking dough. So you go into the store and every all the signage is cookie dough. You got a little logo on your shirt, cookie dough. Who's the owner? Cookie dough, but who's cookie dough? It's just some name somebody. Who right. owns that? Who is the guy that they got to sit? The, the registered agent. Um, the, uh, they can sue the registered agent. Well, they're not suing the registered agent. But, but the, he's uh, the one representative. So right? If you're operating a business, either the sole proprietorship or a corporation, Harvey Fields, my law firm, big law firm, I'm not there anymore. He's retired from there. But we're Carlton Fields PA. But if I show you my business card, it, it's any name other than a precise corporate name. And what we had on our business cards, this is Carlton Fields. The official name is Carlton Fields PA. But, you know, this is Carlton Fields. And guys, our office services, I've like, got these nice, like, pullover shirts that say Carlton Fields on, you know, driving around delivering stuff or whatever. They run somebody over and they see Carlton Fields. They say, Who is see Carlton Fields? Well, there the name is pretty similar. But you can go up on the fictitious name website and you got to register. And you go on and you type the word Carlton Fields in and say, Oh, it's the owner of that name. It's Carlton Fields PA. And then you go on the SunBiz and you look at Carlton Fields PA and they say, Registered agent is. John Doe at 123 Main Street, Miami, Florida. And now if you want to sue Carlton Fields, you know that you deliver the process to 123 Main Street where somebody's going to accept that and starts the clock ticking for the, you got 30 days to respond to a complaint, and whatever. So it, it's a way, there's a lot of people don't operate. You know, you might go into an apartment building and it says, you know, the, uh, the Miramar Apartments, but the corporation that owns it or LLC is one, two, three, you know, Miramar uh, Ventures. You know, and, but so we know who to sue because their letterhead just says, you know, Miramar Apartments. And, but if you type in Miramar Apartments into the fictitious name database, which is probably available, it's going to say the owner of that name is 123 Ventures. You look up 123 Ventures, wherever it was, and so say the registered agent is Mary Smith at Main Street, Maryland. So it's just a way to track people down. So if John Doe is doing business at, and a lot of times if it's a shame, it's what you call a DBA, doing this, John Doe doing this as fast Let's take a break for uh well life. before we do that, which I love, remember legal questions sometimes are very, very personal. And I know you may be here and you have a question, you know, what comes from the reason we have all of these lovely people here is because I want you to be able to be post someone and ask them something first. Second of all, do not under underestimate what is the you did it. the value of this moment. Fill this out. They serve first come first basis. First come, um, first serve. Yeah, not until August. Right, not until August. Mm -hmm. But still, it has to be processed. So you can give him the applications today, and they can start the process. So they know you have, they have your information, and then they'll contact you, and then you'll be able to let them know what. So let's maximize the benefit of their presence. If you have something more personal, you don't want to ask in front of everyone. And the beauty is, if you found that you haven't done any of this, you don't have to tell us. Just go at this organization. Is confidential. These wonderful people can help you go back and get it right. The majority now, the SBA will be with 500,000 small businesses, unfortunately, during COVID, will not reopen. We've seen them on the business The beauty, what most people don't know, about 1.8 million businesses are focused. It's like something. A lot of those people that lost their jobs, they said, I'm never going to be fighting again. I don't have any situation with the market. So we have 1.8 million new businesses. 
why are we doing this? We know that you miss steps, and that's okay, especially when you're talking about growing your business and now getting larger city contracts. You need to have your ducks in order because once you start making the money, the game changes. So to the extent, even if you have identified some things, they have serviced several businesses, right? Mm -hmm. That were already, we're already incorporated. This doesn't make any sense. Why are we here? Because then you can go back and get these things corrected and we have resources available to be able to assist you so that you don't have to do it. That's a beautiful thing. Major in the community team of the city of New York. Thank you so much. They're here. They have to stand up. Anybody that raised their hand want to have a question? 